Hi guys, welcome to the final week of our uh, series looking at the claims of Jesus uh, in the book of John in the Bible, the I Am Sayings. Uh, we've been looking at this under the title, Jesus is Bigger Than You Think. Uh, and this week we arrive at uh, the last, the seventh, I am the vine. When Jesus makes this claim, what is he saying? Let's just have a little reminder what, uh, about the I am uh, section. Remember that Jesus, uh, when he uses this phrase, I am, he's connecting himself back to the story of the Exodus. God saving for himself a people out of slavery. And before uh, the events of the Exodus takes place, he calls Moses to be, his, uh, to be the leader, to be his man. Um, and Moses is, is questioning and doubtful. Uh, and he says, well, who, who shall I say it, it is that's, that's doing all this? And God says, this is my name. I am who I am. Jesus is claiming to be the, the God of Israel, the God of the Exodus, the God who is ever existing, unchanging, unchangeable. The God who is over a world that is always changing, over a people who are never the same day to day, even hour to hour. Jesus says, I am who I am. I am God. And this claim, I am the true vine. I am the, the vine. What would the original hearers and the original readers of John's gospel have understood when Jesus says that he is the vine? I remember when we started this series out, we talked about to, to understand these sayings, we need to go older and we need to go wider, deeper, wider. What would they have understood? As we answer that, I want to take you back to August last year, August the 23rd. Uh, myself and, and Jody uh, and several thousand other people travelled up to, to Leeds, to Headingley, to watch cricket, to watch the Ashes, England versus Australia. Uh, day two, um, the Ashes were in full swing and England were in full retreat, bowled out in 27 overs for 67 and if you'd ask somebody on that day, what does it mean to be an England cricketer? Well, maybe you'd give an answer like this. It means to be humiliated in inevitable defeat. England was so bad. Australia were really good, but England was so bad. When Jesus says, I am the vine, he is associating himself, not with a success story, but with a story of failure. Whenever God describes his people as a vine in the Old Testament, he does so in tones of condemnation and disappointment. Listen to Ezekiel chapter 17. It's one of the places where uh, the people of God are described as the vine. Verse 5 says this, he, he took, that's God, one of the seedlings of the land and put it in fertile soil. He planted it like a willow by abundant water, and it sprouted and became a low-spreading vine. Its branches turned towards him, but its roots remained under it. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out leafy boughs. So far, so good. But Ezekiel 17 goes on. Verse 9 says this, Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Will it thrive? He's talking about the vine. Will it not be uprooted and stripped of its fruits so that it withers? All its new growth will wither. Starts well, goes very poorly. Or, or listen to Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9. You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it and it took root and filled the land. Goes on, verse 12. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Of verse 16, your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Jesus says, I am the vine. And it's thoroughly disappointing. He's associating himself with a failed project and a faithless people. The original hearers would have heard... Really? 
You have a vine? That doesn't end well. But notice in verse 1, he doesn't just say, I am the vine. He says, I am the true vine. Hiding in the ruins of the description of the vine in Psalm 80 is the hope. The hope of a true vine or a true branch or a true son. Let me read to you verses 14 and 15. Psalm 80. Return to us, God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine. The root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Verses 17 and 18. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Let me take you back to Leeds last August. Utter, devastating, terrible play on the 23rd. But on the 25th, Ben Stokes leads England to a scarcely believable victory over Australia. He hits 135, not out the last wicket, puts on 78. And it is incredible. What is an England cricketer then? What is Ben Stokes then? He's a hero. He's a a victor. He's a leader. He's a winner. Jesus is the true vine. Just as in the story on the 23rd of August was not complete. So the story of God's vine was not complete. Jesus is the true vine. The source and object of God's work amongst a fallen, faithless, sinful people. In a fallen, faithless and sinful world. God is growing. Something healthy. Something fruitful. Something vibrant and glorious. Jesus is God's nation. God's family. Jesus is the redeemer. Who rescues a hopeless situation. Okay, take a minute. Have a little wiggle on your sofa. Let's ask the question now. But why? Why is Jesus telling us and telling his his disciples, I am the true vine? John 15 places us in the final few hours before Jesus' betrayal. Before Judas, one of his closest friends, will give him up for money. It's only a few hours before Jesus will stand in various kangaroo courts as people will hurl false accusations at him. And Jesus will stand not defending himself, but they won't be able to find anything against him. And ultimately they will will take him to Pilate and they'll call for his crucifixion. And Pilate will concede and will condemn him to death. And Jesus will be nailed to the cross outside of Jerusalem even though he is innocent and he'll die we're just hours away and jesus is sat around the table with his his disciples firstly 12 and then before this point judas has scarpered to betray him and so 11 are left and jesus is preparing them and encouraging them and equipping them for what is to come Not just in the immediate hours, but beyond that. For the the job that he has got for them. The ministry that they are called to. And he speaks into them knowing that they will have a desire to to make a difference. Because we all want to make a difference, don't we? We we talk about legacy. At the moment, um, the BBC are, are replaying some of the events of London 2012, the Olympics that took place eight years ago here. And and around the time of those Olympics, a lot of talk was about legacy, the difference that having this and hosting these Olympics in, in London, in the UK, will make. Not just for those athletes that were competing for medals then, but for, for future generations of, of children and young people and future medal winners. Legacy. Wanting to make a difference beyond today. Wanting to make a difference from not just for my life, but for other people's lives. And we're all like that. 
We all want to, to make a difference. Some of that is played out with, uh, with our children. We want to, to leave a, a positive legacy for and in our children. And so we give our, our time and our effort and our money into producing future benefit and benefit for other people. We do it in our work. We want to not just maintain the status quo, but we want to make a difference. We want to improve things. And we want that in our church life, don't we? We want REC to be a church that is, is growing, is successful. We want more people to be coming in through the doors whenever they reopen. And that is something that God has put within us. A desire for, well, for fruit, to, to produce the Bible says from the very beginning, God creates mankind and gives them the command to be fruitful, to multiply, to multiply, to, to produce. That is what people are like. That is what people should be. And that is what those disciples will, will desire. After Jesus' death and his resurrection and when he, he, he sends them. And equips them by his spirit to to go out. They'll want to be fruitful. We want to be fruitful. And Jesus is speaking to them. And into that desire he says, I am the true vine. And then he says, and I want you to be fruitful. Jesus wants those 11 disciples and And all of the other disciples who would come after them, followers of Jesus, he wants us to be fruitful. So, what does Jesus tell us about being fruitful here? Well, being fruitful means, verse 2, that you'll be pruned. That God the Father is the great gardener. And like every good gardener, he knows that to produce the, the best... You don't just leave things to grow, but you actively take a role. And sometimes that means pruning, cutting back. And that's painful and uncomfortable, but it produces more fruit. Being fruitful means that we'll be placed in such a position that we'll want to ask great things of God. Look down at verse 7 of John 15. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Just hear the scope of what Jesus says to his disciples. That by being connected to Jesus, and with this desire to be fruitful, it will cause us to ask great things of our Father. Ask whatever you wish. Jesus is painting the picture there of stuff that goes beyond our beyond our ability, beyond perhaps even our comprehension. That God is doing great things. And if we are to be fruitful, it will look like praying big prayers. And praying for things that we cannot accomplish by ourselves. There are so many things that we could point out here, but let me let me focus in on two. Being fruitful first means, firstly, we have to be in the vine. This is the, the garden image that Jesus is using. He is the vine. We, the followers of Jesus, are branches. And branches only produce fruit if they're connected to the vine. If you chop a branch off, it won't produce fruit. It will wither and die. And so if we are to produce fruit, we must be joined to Jesus. We must be in the vine. We get that in our gardens, don't we? We get the fact that if you cut flowers off a plant, eventually, fairly shortly, they'll die. They'll wither and die. In the same way, Jesus says, if you want to be fruitful you have to be connected to Jesus and this takes us out of our 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 normal default about what fruit is what success is because 
There are, there are all sorts of successes and legacies in our world that have got nothing to do with Jesus. But Jesus says, if you want to produce the fruit that I'm talking about, you have to be in me. And that means that we have to ignore the, the worldly measures of success. We have to ignore popularity. We have to ignore money. We have to ignore numbers about how big our church is. How many people are coming through the doors or how many people are, are watching our YouTube videos. You can only truly be fruitful in the way that Jesus is talking about. In a way that lasts beyond this life and beyond this world. If you are in Jesus. If he, as, as Jesus says in these, these, these verses, if you are clean because of his word that you have received his message and you have believed and you have thrown your lot in with him. If his spirit has opened your eyes to your need of him, of Jesus, to take away your sin, to make you right with God, to do what you cannot do. It's joined you to Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. Only then can you be fruitful. But secondly, being fruitful means remaining in the vine. Let me read verse 5 to us. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. We must remain in the vine. We must remain in Christ, knowing him, enjoying him, delighting in him, listening to him, obeying him. Don't imagine, don't mistake the fact that simply doing is enough. Because we can do all sorts of things. We can do all sorts of events. We can do all sorts of ministries. We can do all sorts of evangelism. We can literally share the good news of Jesus with other people and yet not be connected to Jesus, not be remaining in him. And if that's the case, then all those things will amount to nothing. We will produce no fruit. Well, that's a scary thought because doing is perhaps easier than remaining in Jesus. And doing is easier because, because it gives us more of the credit. We want to be able to turn around to Jesus and go, look at all that I've done. Aren't you pleased? And we remove the reality of our sinfulness. We remove the reality of our need for grace. We begin to think that God, well, he saved us because, to be honest, we're quite good. Uh, we need to remain in Jesus. We need to lean into him, to know him, to be people that are prayerfully dependent upon him and delighting in him we need to be people who do obey his commands because we love him and because we're living for him thirdly being fruitful means that you will be shown to be a follower of jesus listen to verse eight this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples being fruitful means that we will be recognized as followers of jesus and that gives us a great clue as to what the fruit will look like remember again jesus is sat at the table talking talking to his disciples just hours away from the cross what is the fruit look like that Jesus is talking about here what will it look like to produce that fruit well it will look like suffering and it will look 
like joy bringing to others. And it will look sometimes as though it's not fruitful at all. It will look like defeat. It will look like the cross. But the fruit will be there. And it might not be immediate, but it will be long lasting. It will be eternal. That's the sort of fruit that Jesus is producing in his people. But Jesus and the Father desire and promise that those that are in Christ will produce fruit. Because this is how God has ordained that fruit will be produced in this world. Through branches connected to the vine. And it will be done for the glory of God. And it will be the evidence that we are the disciples of Jesus because we'll look like him and our fruit production will make much of the father and of the son by the power of the spirit and it will bring glory to God not to us not to us but to your name be the glory Psalm 115 verse 1 that's the sort of fruit and if you read on into John 15, it's a fruit that is riven through with love. Love for God, love for, for God's people. So this week, this is the call to us as a church. To remain in Jesus. And to seek the fruit that lasts and brings glory to God. Not fruit that, that is comfortable. Not fruit that is immediate, but fruit that, that is like the work of Jesus. That shows us to be his disciples because so, we follow the same path. Let me pray. Father God, we pray and ask that, that REC would be a, a church, a people that produces fruit for your glory father re renew and reshape our expectation of what fruit looks like let us walk in the steps of christ lord and let it be seen amongst ourselves to ourselves and to the world that we are followers of jesus and father we do pray rightly lord that you would grow your church but we pray that would not just be about us. Father, we pray for the churches across our nation and across our world. Would you grow your church? Would you produce much fruit as you have promised? Lord, let us be in Jesus. And as he is in us through his spirit, let us be empowered, Lord, and sanctified to want to produce fruit that glorifies you. Lord, let us decrease, let Christ increase. In his name we ask. Amen.